He stated in the latter, as every individual therefore endeavors as much as he can both to employ his capital in the support of domestic industry and so to direct that industry that its produce may be of the greatest value, every individual necessarily labors to render the annual revenue of the society as great as he can. He generally, indeed, neither intends to promote the public interest, nor knows how much he is promoting it. He intends only his own gain, and he is in this, as in many other cases, led by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of his intention. Nor is it always the worse for the society that it was no part of it. By pursuing his own interest, he frequently promotes that of the society more effectually than when he really intends to promote it. The nearly religious ideal had a powerful effect on the post-Smith era, giving a very social vindication for the inherently self-maximizing anti-social behavior common to capitalist psychology. This basic philosophy was to develop in part as the foundation of neoclassical economics beginning in the late 19th century. Smith Knowing quite well the class conflicts inherent to capitalism, goes on to discuss the nature of how some men gain superiority over the greater part of their brethren, reinforcing what was to increasingly be considered a law of nature regarding human power and subjugation by further theorists. His view of property was in harmony with John Locke, elaborating on how society itself is manifest around it. He stated, civil government, so far as it is instituted for the security of property, is in reality instituted for the defense of the rich against the poor, or of those who have some property against those who have none at all. Property as an institution also requires a means to justify respective value. To this end, various theories of value have been and continue to be postulated often sourced in origin back to Aristotle's politics, Smith's contribution is still widely referenced as a pivotal influence. In effect, Smith builds upon Locke's mixing labor premise of production and ownership and extends from there, creating a labor theory of value. He states, labor was the first price, the original purchase, money that was paid for all things. It was not by gold or by silver, but by labor that all the wealth of the world was originally purchased, and its value to those who possess it and who want to exchange it for some new productions is precisely equal to the quantity of labor which it can enable them to purchase or command. Many chapters of Book One of Wealth of Nations work to explain the nature of prices and values respective to his denoted income class categories of wages, rents, and profits. However, it will be found that his logic is rather circular in specifics as the price assessments are found to originate merely from other price assessments in a chain with no real starting point other than the loose distinction of applied labor, which has, of course, no intrinsic static monetary qualification. This problem of ambiguity in both the dominant labor and utility theories of value common to capitalists' market theory will be addressed in detail later in this essay. Overall, Smith's economic theory supported laissez-faire capitalism as the highest mode of socio-economic operation, stating that it was a system of natural liberty, and every man, as long as he does not violate the laws of justice, is left perfectly free to pursue his own interests, his own way, and to bring both his industry and capital into competition with those of any other man or order of men. This later concept, as will be argued in the essay Value System Disorder, is a rather naive assumption of human behavior and, in effect, a contradiction in terms. Malthus and Ricardo Thomas Malthus and David Ricardo were two well-acknowledged leading theorists of political economy of the early 19th century. They were friendly rivals by some comparison, but from the broad view of history they shared virtually the same perspective, closely tied to Adam Smith's. 
The late Industrial Revolution in Europe and America was a period of extensive conflict between laborers and capitalist owners. Numerous revolts and strikes in response to abhorrent and abusive working conditions for not only men but also women and children were common. This gave rapid rise to the now common labor unions and general battle between workers and owners has continued ever since. To emphasize the extent of this class warfare in England, the Combination Act of 1799 was imposed, which basically outlawed any combination of workers to group together for power in order to, in effect, exert influence or inhibit the interests of their employers. Historian Paul Mantou, writing of this period, commented on the absolute and uncontrolled power of the capitalist. In this, the heroic age of great undertakings, it was acknowledged, admitted, and even proclaimed with brutal candor. It was the employer's own business. He did as he chose and did not consider that any other justification of his conduct was necessary. He owed his employees wages, and once those were paid, the men had no further claim on him. It was in the midst of all this that Malthus and Ricardo invariably contextualized their economic and social views. Beginning with Malthus, his classic work, An Essay on the Principle of Population, orients around essentially two assumptions. The first is that the class structure of wealthy proprietors and poor laborers would inevitably reemerge, no matter what reforms were attempted. He considered it a law of nature. The second idea, something of a corollary to first, was simply that poverty and suffering and hence economic divides were inevitable consequences of natural law. His thesis on population rests upon the very simple assumption that population, when unchecked, increases in a geometrical ratio. Subsistence increases only in an arithmet arithmetical ratio. Therefore, if the standard of living of everyone in society were increased, the vast majority would respond by increasing the amount of children they have. In turn, population outpacing subsistence would very soon push the population back to poverty. It was only through moral restraint, a social quality that he implies to belong to the more upstanding upper class, that this problem is checked by behavior. Evidently, the difference between the wealthy and the poor was the high moral character of the former and the base morality of the latter. Again, as noted prior in this essay, the intuitive cultural condition has had a great deal to do with the prevailing premises of thought that have guided economic operations into the modern day. While many today might dismiss Malthus and these clearly outdated ideas, the seeds were deeply planted in the economic doctrines, values, and class relationships that occurred during and after his time. In fact, those of a more conservative mindset still commonly cite variations of his population theory when dealing with economically less developed countries. Malthus, along with Locke and Smith, also held deeply Christian convictions in their frames of reference whether directly extracted from scripture or based on personal interpretation. Malthus frames his moral restraint with the implication that a true Christian would righteously denounce such base vices and also accept the inevitable misery necessary to keep population from outstripping resource subsistence. Likewise, just as there is enormous debate today with respect to laws pertaining to the notion and use of welfare or public aid programs to help the poor, Malthus naturally was a big proponent of the abolition of what were then called the poor laws, as was David Ricardo. Moving on to Ricardo, he essentially accepted Malthus's population theory and conclusions regarding the nature and causes of elements of Malthus's theory of value, theory of gluts, and certain class assumptions since most of these disagreements in detail are superfluous to this broad discussion at hand and arguably outdated in general. Ricardo's most notable contributions to economic thought will be the point of focus. 
In 1821, Ricardo finished the third edition of his influential Principles of Political Economy and Taxation. In the preface, he states his interest. The produce of the earth, all that is derived from its surface by the united application of labor, machinery, and capital, is divided among three classes of the community, namely the proprietor of the land, the owner of the stock of capital necessary for its cultivation, and the laborers by whose industry it is cultivated. To determine the laws which regulate this distribution is the principal problem in political economy. While critical of certain aspects of Adam Smith's labor theory of value, he still supported the basic distinction, stating, possessing utility, commodities derive their exchangeable values from two sources, from their scarcity and from the quantity of labor required to obtain them. In common with Smith, he elaborates, if the quantity of labor realized in commodities regulates their exchangeable value, every increase of the quantity of labor must augment the value of that commodity on which it is exercised as every dim diminution must lower it. Consequently, Ricardo viewed society and the class divisions of his time from the labor perspective, and it logically went that the interests of workers and capitalists were opposed. If wages should rise, he often stated, then profits would necessarily fall. Yet even though this disharmony alludes to an underlying interest of each class to work to gain advantage over the other for their benefit, often resulting in general imbalance in large part due to the power of the capitalist owners to control labor and set policy, coupled with the advent of mechanization, machine application, which systematically reduced the need for human labor in applied sectors, he alludes to the conviction that the theory of capitalism, if correctly applied, should always create full, full employment in the long run. On the specific issue of machine application displacing human labor for the advantage of the manufacturer, he states, <clears throat> The manufacturer, who can have recourse to a machine which shall lower the cost of production on his commodity, would enjoy peculiar advantages if he could continue to charge the same price for his goods, but he would be obliged to lower the prices of his commodities, or capital would flow to his trade till his profits had sunk to the general level. Thus, then, is the public benefited by machinery. However, as with other aspects of his writing, contradiction is common. While maintaining the basic idea that the general public would benefit from the introduction of labor displacing machinery under the assumption that market prices would cleanly decline and those displaced would always smoothly relocate in the third edition of his principles, Ricardo starts chapter 31 by stating, Ever since I first turned my attention to questions of political economy, I have been of the opinion that an application of machinery to any branch of production as should have the effect of saving labor was a general good, but that the substitution of machinery for human labor is often very injurious to the interests of the class of laborers. He later requalifies the argument by stating, the statements which I have made will not, I hope, lead to the inference that machinery should not be encouraged. To elucidate the principle, I have been supposing that improved machinery is suddenly discovered and extensively used. But the truth is that these discoveries are gradual, and rather operate in determining the employment of the capital which is saved and accumulated, than in diverting capital from its actual employment. His general dismissal of the issue of humans being displaced by machines, later to be called technological unemployment, will also be found in common with many other economists that followed him, including John Maynard Keynes, who stated in line with Ricardo's general assumption of adjustment, we are being afflicted with a new disease of which some readers may not yet have heard the name, but of which they will hear a great deal in the years to come namely technological unemployment, 
This means unemployment due to our discovery of means of ec economizing the use of labor, outrunning the pace at which we can find new uses for labor. But this is only a temporary phase of maladjustment. All this means in the long run that mankind is solving its economic problem. The subject is brought up here as an accent of focus because it will be revisited in part three of this text, presenting a context of technological application apparently unrealized or disregarded by the major economic theorists of modern history, who again are often look, locked into a narrow frame of reference. As a final point regarding Ricardo, he is also credited for his contribution to international free trade, specifically his theory of comparative advantage, along with perpetuation of the basic invisible hand ethos of Adam Smith. Ricardo states, under a system of perfectly free commerce, each country naturally devotes its capital and labor to such employments as are most beneficial to each. This pursuit of individual advantage is admirably connected with the universal good of the whole. By stimulating industry, by rewarding ingenuity, and by using most efficaciously the peculiar powers bestowed by nature, it distributes labor most effectively and most economically, while by increasing the general mass of productions, it diffuses general benefit and binds together by one common tie of interest and intercourse the universal society of nations throughout the civilized world.